Um, surprise number one would be for me. Uh, I don't know about Jennifer, but uh, we discussed this. Maybe she shares the sentiment is that uh, we've struggled a lot ourselves um, to actually write the narrative we were trying to change. Mm. So obviously, uh, writing the first draft yep. of our two chapters that we wrote, the introduction and the diaspora chapter, and then everybody else's as well, was a real struggle because we ourselves have been trained and read about Bosnia as a country, yeah. uh, which sense. is, you know, the, the things that we explained already. So, and then when we read what we wrote, we were like, this is wrong. This is not what we're trying to do. And in many and ways, it didn't mirror the conversation mm -hmm. we were having exactly. ourselves. That's right. So it was a paradigmatic shift. Yeah. Absolutely. There was an right. idea of what we wanted to right. do, but when it, when it comes to writing, it was difficult to start a sentence with Bosnia and Herzegovina, da, 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 yeah. da. But it, it usually started So we with, had to police ourselves. Yeah, exactly. There was a lot in of self-policing, and then when we realized that, we also, also yeah, tried to police other contributors <laughs> and then and then it, it was really surprising of how you know you start with an idea you have it it's clear you know what you want to do and when the execution comes it's really difficult because you're somehow entrenched in the narrative that everybody else yeah, has it's established been internalized. Yeah. Exactly. we've all internalized it yeah and what about you Janetta? I, I mean in many ways I would probably echo what what you said um, what Yasmin said uh, Beyond that, I was quite struck <laughs> by the speed of our whole publication process and by the, the, the sort of, from the initial thinking about what we wanted to put together to then um, putting the volume together and, and the sort of enthusiasm. And I know this sounds somewhat um, sappy, but it's, it's, it was quite surprising when you're working with a team of what? Twelve academics that more or less everybody met all deadlines mm -hmm. and we submitted very quickly within a mm -hmm. year we wrote everything went through multiple drafts and, and really had had the whole book um, and for me I think it's very much um, reflective of once those conversations were had once everybody was on the same page about the shifts mm -hmm. in thinking that then suddenly drafts were flowing and writing was flowing and the conversation was very lively. Mm -hmm. And I think that's carried on post-publication into the different discussions we've had, both in Bosnia and abroad. Um, and I think it's a sort of lovely surprise, I guess. It was really fast. Yeah. It's the fastest publication I've ever been associated with. It's, it's incredible. And the second thing I want to ask you is I actually met Janetta because of a diaspora conference mm -hmm. we held together at Karen in 2015, 2016? 2016. 2016. And can you, I, I'd like to hear your thoughts about the diaspora chapter because I know this is something both of you are really mm -hmm. interested in. And just as a person who didn't really study it, I would say it's a huge untapped resource, just at first glance, because I know so many people in the diaspora that want to help, but there's no access points. I'd love to hear what you found. Mm -hmm. I'll start. Sure, I'll start. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a topic that's close to both of our hearts. <laughs> the majority of both our PhDs are on different aspects of that diaspora uh, policy and the diaspora itself, as well as the policy towards it or the lack of policy. <laughs> in some degree. So what we do in the chapter is what we, we really try to sort of trace the, the historical development of that relationship. And in many ways, it's a tenuous relationship, right? And when we speak about the Bosnian diaspora today, for the first time up until maybe even five, 10 years ago, it, it was considered a relatively derogatory term to be called a diaspora member in, in, in the country, right? Somebody other, somebody not of the country. And it's it was considered relatively hurtful because the majority of that diaspora population um, has been conflict generated as a result of the war, right? Um, so when we speak about the, the Bosnian diaspora, while there are, right, and there have been waves of migration from this region prior to the 1990s, if you think of the classic mm -hmm. sort of guest workers, Gastabaitos, coming from former Yugoslavia to countries like Germany, Right? Migration from the region is nothing new. It has right. been ongoing previous and is, continues to be
be ongoing today, probably in more problematic ways, right? Um, and so what we did in the chapter is to sort of look at, you know, during the Yugoslav period, there was a clear policy about how um, the relationship looked towards the guest worker population. But then in the post-conflict period, right, the conflict generated population. The state sort of focuses on it at first in terms of um, property uh, return. return, right? The return of property that was taken away during the war. And so the relationship isn't necessarily one of come back to your country, um, you know, we're, we're, we're back, right? The conflict has ended, but rather in terms of um, how to regain property and how to sort of um, figure out those questions. And in many ways, that's very much a success story, right? Um, the problem, of course, being that many of individuals, you know, the, the, the idea that was envisioned of people returning their properties and then actually returning to the, to the country um, didn't actually end up working out as, as it was envisioned is, is a whole nother debate. Um, but, and then the sort of over the last, you know, 20 years thereafter, very much no policy towards this, this population, right? There, there is not, a, as many other countries have, a ministry of diaspora. Um, there is a, within the Ministry of Human Rights and Refugees, a sector for diaspora that, you know, has five employees, six Eleven maybe? Now. Eleven now, as of a few years ago, but up until a few years ago, five or six employees that were focused on a population of, Two. if the country has about 3.8 million, a population that if, you know, by generous estimates is two million, by more conservative estimates is over one million, 1 1.2 million. And so this is too much, right, for, for five individuals. Um, and so what we do is we trace it from, from there to over the last sort of five years, an involvement with the population more in terms of uh, development, right? This idea of uh, diaspora and development, diaspora being a driver for development in the country. Um, diaspora being um, in terms of something that needs to be managed, right? A population that needs to be managed but should be investing back, right? And sort of forging that relationship. Um, but then, you know, in terms of the things that political scientists or sociologists look at, um, citizenship rights, voting rights, that has been relatively um, underexplored, right? And, and in many ways is something that many individuals have grievances about, um, uh, as well as a variety of different transitional justice issues about how the state has dealt with the conflict period and the, and the aftermath of it. Um, you have more to add. We could talk about this for hours, but it is it is, yeah. it is quite a long, I mean, uh, sure. chapter. But uh, the the problem with the Bosnian diaspora, I would say, uh, I mean, the the building block of every diaspora study literature is diaspora itself. What we do here is diaspora management, diaspora governance, sort of uh, chapter where we try to figure out how has our government um, managed its diaspora from the very beginnings. Uh, or mismanaged. Mismanaged. In, in the a better word, actually, uh, because they called them the citizens abroad in a very broad term to, to encapsulate everybody. The Gastavites from the 70s mm -hmm. and their uh, you know, offspring and yeah. everybody who, who was generated during the war. So it's a, it's a very broad term that they used. Uh, and then up until 2018, they have come to terms with that this population is actually diaspora. So all this genesis of citizens abroad to diaspora is what we focus on. In here. However, what is um, problematic about it is that uh, Bosnian diaspora is very, uh, as, as a country itself, is very uh, multicultural and, and has many ethnic groups. Uh, some of the ethnic groups that live abroad do not of, often identify with Bosnia. They would rather consider themselves a diaspora of neighboring countries, mm -hmm. Croatia and Serbia. So uh, there's a problem of who do you refer to as a government official, who do you reach out, who wants to be part of your diaspora rather than attached part of someone else's diaspora that they consider themselves you know, members of and so on and so forth. So there's Which this population should you be managing? Right? What, what are you managing? If someone, a Croat from Bosnia goes to Germany and he lives there for 20 years, also has Croatian citizenship, he would rather or she would rather attach themselves to the Croatian state and Croatian diaspora for that matter because the state is more organized so they can reap more benefits from 
um, Zagreb, then from Sarajevo, and so on and so forth. So the, and the same case, uh, the same thing goes for uh, Serbs from Bosnia also living abroad. So this is the, the problem that they're having. However, there is uh, a recent development in diaspora management as well pushed from the internationals. Uh, there are two large projects uh, which started in 2016 and 17, one funded by the Swiss Development Council uh, called uh, Diaspora for Development, D4D, and the other one by USAID, so Americans, uh, harnessing diaspora potentials, both worth $5 million, so five and five, $10 million uh, altogether. Uh, and the projects have uh, jump-started many processes about uh, diaspora management abroad, because a lot of money has been invested in, in uh, building local capacities to manage diaspora, not only at the state level, at the ministry, which has 11 employees, uh, working with 1.2 to 2 million people, but also with locals. So going really uh, locally to municipalities and then training a lot of different uh, officers to become diaspora officers to yeah. negotiate with diaspora members directly when they come back, uh, when they want to invest or when they want to uh, deal with their local communities that they uh, escaped from, usually just which they left. Yeah. So in many ways the chapter does dissect what we speak about in the book in terms of foreign policy, about how sort of foreign policy is diffused through these different levels. Um, on one hand, you know, the international community has this idea that diaspora for development is lovely. Let's throw some money on it, right? Here's these two projects. I'm speaking very informally now, right? Um, and then how does that trickle down? How does the foreign policy actually look like, right? Where does it happen? It happens on the very local levels, right? There's, diff there's 16. 16, 16 municipalities, now, municipalities yeah. within Bosnia that are particularly focused as if you're a diaspora member from X community and here's the local community folks. So like New Yorkers abroad, right? The city of New York would be working with you rather than the American this, government, yes, right? Rather than New York.